Welcome uh, to the PMMI webinar for the second quarter um, quarterly economic outlook report with Chris Steele from ITR Economics. Chris is an economist at ITR and he provides economic consulting services with a great deal of insight and action-oriented advice for small businesses, trade associations, and Fortune 500 companies. Chris also has uh, brought in-depth insights of industry trends to the ITR Economics team with his willingness to go above and beyond in his daily research for our clients. Chris graduated from UMass Amherst with a BA in economics and served six years in the National Guard. His attention to detail, ability to understand a client's specific needs, and organizational skills create an enjoyable partnership with, with each of his clients. Today, Chris will interpret the information included in the quarterly outlook and provide insight on how today's economy may be affecting your packaging and processing operations. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Chris, please type your question in the chat box that is located in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. At the end of the presentation, which will last approximately 30 to 40 minutes, he will answer your questions. At this point, I would like to hand the webinar over to Chris with ITR Economics. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and uh, everyone else, thank you for joining us for uh, this month's quarterly economic outlook. Um, now, before I get started, Rebecca, I'm afraid I'm experiencing uh, just one last technical error. Um, are, are you able to see my screen right now as I have it up? Uh, I am not. So, um, so now I am. Excellent. There you go. I'm not able to see it either. Yeah, mine just came up. Is this I good for everyone? It should be on uh, just the title screen here. I think I think we're good. It seemed like there was just a slight lag. Excellent, not a problem at all. Uh, again, so uh, Rebecca, thank you, um, and thank you everyone for uh, bearing with us while we work through those little bugs. Uh, and again, welcome to this month's market forecast webinar. Uh, looking back on 2016, it was definitely an exciting year. The conference has been muted. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Uh, but we also moved into a new period of uh, political uncertainty and saw a uh, regime change in the, uh, the, in the White House uh, that, again, was exciting but oftentimes uncertain. So as we're going through today's webinar, first off, I'd like to take a look back at 2016. Uh, we are going to go over ITR's expectations for the macroeconomy as a whole and see how they played out. And then we're going to move into what we're seeing right now on the uh, national economy uh, at the most. The conference has been muted. PMMI-specific micro-indicators that we are, all are excited to look at. But before I jump into any of that, I'd like to go over our terminology and methodology. Uh, this is mostly for those of you who have not been here uh, for any of our previous webinars or are maybe uh, a little unfamiliar with ITR's uh, industry-specific terminology and methodology. Basically, I just want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language, that there's no confusion or uncertainty when I discuss certain metrics. To start off, we're going to talk about the two main metrics we use here at ITR uh, for uh, describing certain segments of the economy. Those are our data trends and our rates of change. Our data trends are simply our moving totals or our moving averages. We use both quarterly moving totals and uh, quarter uh, annual moving totals. So what that means is essentially the most recent three months and 12 months of data summed up respectively. We use these moving totals to sum up things that are uh, logically easy to add together. For example, sales or dollars or shipments or units. Uh, however, with some metrics, uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense to add them together. In that case, we use moving averages. Again, that's going to be the most recent either three months or 12 months of data averaged together. We use moving averages when we look at certain things such as production indices, uh, or price levels, which again, aren't logically consistent when you add them up. We also have our rates of change analogs to our three months and 12 month moving totals or averages. 
We call these our 312s or 1212s, also our quarterly growth rates or annual growth rates. Just like we had the most recent three months or 12 months of data added up, our 312 is the most recent three months of data compared to the same three months one year prior, hence the quarterly growth rate. The 1212 is, again, simply the most recent 12 months of data compared to the year before that, hence our annual growth rate or annual rate of change. 312s and 1212s are our primary metrics we use when we're looking at uh, where either a certain company or aspect of the economy is within the overall business cycle. But before we get to that, I would like to define how ITR considers the business cycle. We have four main phases. You'll see this in the bottom of my screen with that four-colored uh, sine curve. In the bottom left-hand quadrant of that box, we have in blue phase A recovery. Phase A recovery is uh, essentially the first sign of hope within an economy or in an industry. I like to consider it the light at the end of the tunnel phase of the business cycle. The annual growth rate is still negative, uh, so your sales or your metric is still below the year ago level. However, that 1212 is moving up toward the zero line. So on a month to month basis, things are becoming progressively less worse. Uh, you'll hear us say that the pace of decline is lessening or softening. Once that 12-12 rises up and passes the zero line, we transition to phase B, accelerating growth of the business cycle. Phase B is where we want to be all the time. It is the best phase of the business cycle. And again, that is when the 12-12 is above zero. So we are above the year ago level and it is rising higher and higher on a month to month basis. So the pace of growth or the pace of rise is accelerating on a month-to-month -month basis. Once that 12-12 hits a peak and begins to decline, which we call a, a cyclical peak or a business cycle high, we transition into the upper right-hand quadrant, that yellow portion of the sine curve, into phase C, slower growth. Phase C, slower growth, is our cautionary phase of the business cycle. Um, things are still good. It's still an inflationary environment. Um, sales are rising on a year-over-year on a -year basis. You're doing progressively better than you were one year prior. However, that 12-12 is declining, meaning that on a month-to-month -month basis, the rate of growth is beginning to slow. Once that 12-12 then falls below the zero line, uh, we fall into phase D, recession. This is when, again, the 12-12 uh, or annual growth rate is below year-ago levels. Uh, and the rate of decline is accelerating on a monthly basis. So things are becoming progressively worse and worse. Uh, obviously, as I'm sure you all know, uh, phase D recession is the worst phase of the business cycle and where you don't want your company or your industry to find itself. This is an idealized uh, theoretical version of the business cycle, and it's important to note that um, on any year-to-year -year basis, we don't always see all four phases of the business cycle in this nice, neat order. Ideally, we'll see what we consider a soft landing. This is where we're in that phase C, slower growth trend. Our 12-12 is declining, uh, and we're starting to become a little cautious, a little worrisome about falling into phase D recession. However, it reaches a cyclical low or a business cycle low before crossing that zero line and transitions directly back to phase B, accelerating growth. Uh, this is generally during times of uh, significant advancement, uh, technological advancement within a portion of the economy, or just a time of general macroeconomic rise. Conversely, we also have a hard landing. Uh, again, this is the situation you don't want to find yourself in. This is when you're in phase A, recovery of the business cycle, down in the bottom left. Your 12-12 is below zero but rising, and you're starting to see that light at the end of the tunnel, as I like to consider it. However, you reach a business cycle high before transitioning to that phase B, accelerated growth trend, and go directly from phase A to phase D, recession. Industries generally find themselves during times of uh, stagnation, uh, or competition from burgeoning industries, or also during times of macroeconomic recession. Uh, imagine your 2001, 2002, uh, after the tech bubble burst, or most recently in the wake of the great financial crisis. 
these slides will all be made available to you uh, in the wake of our discussion today. And I urge you, if you have any questions about anything that ITR is reporting on or anything that I went over today, um, please, I really do urge you to come back and look at this slide. It's a good little primer on uh, how we here at ITR Economics uh, both quantify and think about the economy uh, as well as talk about it. Another term you'll hear us use here very often uh, is leading indicator. Um, we'll talk about how employment is a leading indicator for the economy overall uh, or something to that nature. What we mean by a leading indicator is a certain series of the economy or a uh, certain indicator or survey that tends to react to changes in the fabric of the economy uh, before you see that in the overall data. Here you can see we have uh, two 12-12 annual growth rates um, of an idealized company, uh, company A in that light blue cyan color, uh, and just a generic made up uh, leading indicator in that dark blue color. If you look here, you can see how those business cycle troughs and peaks tend to occur to the left of the graph beforehand temporally uh, than they do for that company. And when we see this, we see that it can be used as a leading indicator by shifting it over to the right. Uh, and now there's not a uh, visual that's playing right now, but it's very easy to see is that when this happens on a consistent basis, you can take that blue leading indicator and shift it rightward. What this does is it lets the tip of the most recent data extend into the future uh, and essentially give us some nice predictive power. We here at ITR Economics as a business cycle consulting firm rely heavily on leading indicators and they are a cornerstone of our proprietary forecasting methodology. However, as much faith as we put in them, it is important to, uh, to stress that you should never be looking at one single leading indicator and making decisions based off of that leading indicator. No matter how tight the cyclical relationship historically has been and how strong of an indicator it has been, uh, the economy is uh, fluid and ever-changing, ever and all of you know that. Because of this, we can see what we consider false signals in a leading indicator, where a leading indicator either turns up or turns down without a resulting uh, corresponding increase in either your company or industry sales. To avoid this, uh, we look at a basket of five to seven leading indicators for every segment of the economy that we're interested in. You can do this for your own company as well. Once you see the majority of these five to seven, so three, four, or five leading indicators, all making uh, cyclical turns in unison, that is a statistically significant indicator uh, that your company or the segment of the economy that you're interested in is going to make that turn as well. You'll hear me talk a lot more about leading indicators uh, as we get further into the report. Before we get there, uh, as I said, I wanted to look back at 2016. Uh, again, definitely uh, there were some pain points, especially if you're heavily tied to either uh, the mining or industrial sectors of the U.S. economy, um, as we saw the oil and commodity price crash and the, the subsequent downturn in activity. So I wanted to look at our expectations for the U.S. economy uh, as of 2016, and now that we have data closing out uh, the entirety of the year, see how we did four to five quarters out. Now, as every economist and every economic forecasting firm will tell you, there are years where you get it and years where you don't. That's simply the nature of the game when it comes to forecasting and projecting into the future. Uh, I'm very proud to say and very excited to say for the rest of my talk today uh, that 2016 was a year where we got it. Uh, here you see eight of the most widely tracked macroeconomic indicators, uh, U.S. gross domestic product, U.S. industrial production, China industrial production, retail sales, housing, employment. These are all benchmark series that uh, you're all very familiar with, I'm sure, uh, that show up in the mainstream media, uh, they're espoused in political circles, and they're mentioned on a day-to-day -day basis when we think about the direction of the economy as a whole. You can see their accuracy rating was in the high 90 percentiles for all of these largest indicators. What this tells me is that what I was telling you last quarter and two quarters ago, and we were looking at uh, even three quarters ago in early 2016, essentially still stands. The first year of our long-term outlook 
came into play just as we, as we expected it to. And I want you to keep that in mind as, as another little piece of evidence that our long-term outlook remains valid. However, I would never ask you to uh, rely just on our historical accuracy in order to look into the future. Uh, and that's where I look forward into really digging into the most recent leading indicator evidence today. I want to look at one of uh, some of the benchmark indicators are saying. Uh, we're going to step back away from a lot of the political uncertainty um, and economic and policy discussion that has been going on and look solely at the data and see what that's telling us. Uh, and I think it's going to be very reassuring um, and I look forward to, uh, to moving forward with that. But first, we'll look at the U.S. economy as a whole. Here we have U.S. gross domestic product. Gross domestic product, or just GDP for short, um, is one of the most widely touted indicators for the health of an overall economy uh, because it attempts, it attempts to capture the entirety of production or the e entirety of economic exchange within an economy. Here you can see that uh, the 312, the quarterly growth rate, which is what we look at when we look at GDP growth, uh, is positive and has reached a business cycle low in 2016 and transitioned to that nice phase B accelerating growth trend. We expect this accelerating growth trend to uh, rise or persist through 2017, finishing up in the 3% range. Uh, then you'll see that it turns a corner rather sharply in 2018. This is a key part of our current long-term outlook. We do expect a transition to phase C, slower growth, for the overall U.S. economy in 2018, and you'll see that 12-12 decline. However, it's important to note that phase C slower growth is still general positivity. You'll still be uh, feeling some nice economic tailwinds during that time. It's not until 2019 that we expect the U.S. economy to fall into its next economic recession. If you've been following along with our outlook here at ITR Economics uh, or any of the PMMI webinars in the past quarters, um, this will not be uh, new information to you. Uh, but it is still very much something that we're both tracking and expecting. The U.S. consumer has really been the driver of economic growth over the past year. As I mentioned, we saw a lot of industrial headwinds, uh, low prices which were discouraging uh, heavy equipment purchases, as well as a uh, historic plummet in most commodity prices, especially those tied uh, to industry and energy. However, you can see that despite the uh, U.S. industrial economy feeling some significant pain, gross domestic product, the U.S. economy as a whole, managed to actually avoid recession and have one of those nice soft landings. That's because U.S. personal consumption drives nearly two-thirds of overall GDP. Retail sales have been up in the high 1% to low 2% range while adjusting for inflation. Uh, over the past year or so, uh, which is a very strong indicator that the U.S. consumer is healthy. We're making more money, we're spending more money, and that's what's driving that growth. We've also seen some, uh, some fairly strong activity in the housing market, again, another important leading economic indicator, and that's what's going to continue to drive that accelerating growth trend we're seeing throughout 2017 and into 2018. The decline in 2019 is going to be primarily consumer-driven once again. So the consumer is bringing the U.S. economy on the up right now, but it will also lead uh, to us falling into recession in late 2019. We expect to see higher interest rates, uh, some slowing consumption, and after a significant period of rise, also a slowdown in the housing market. Now, uh, I don't want any of you to panic. I know you hear that kind of capital R recession, and you think back uh, eight or nine years now, to the wake of the great financial crisis and really the shock waves that were felt throughout the U.S. economy and the global economy indeed, this is going to be nothing like that. Uh, it's going to be a low single digit year over year decline, uh, more of a slowdown than it is going to be a true recession like we're used to in the past decade or so. Now this brings us, as I mentioned before, to U.S. industrial production. Because for a lot of you, that nice soft landing, that period of general sustained rise in the U.S. economy might sound a little surprising uh, because I'm sure some of you with ties to the industrial economy are still feeling 
um, a significant amount of pain and, and the environment might still feel recessionary for you. The reason I'd like to look at U.S. industrial production is because this is, uh, here at ITR um, and within many forecasting firms, one of our major benchmarks for the overall economy as opposed to just GDP. U.S. industrial production comprises three main components, uh, the mining sector, public utilities, uh, and then also manufacturing. Of those three sectors, manufacturing is the sole sector that's expanding on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, it managed to avoid recession, falling just about even with the year prior, so uh, no significant growth or anything to cheer about right now, um, but definitely a sign of uh, at least relative positivity within the U.S. industrial economy. Uh, again, mining and utilities were both down significantly in the face of low commodity prices and just generally depressed demand globally and especially from some of the world's uh, emerging markets. Imagine your Brazil's your China's, your India's. However, if you look at this 12-12 rate of change for U.S. industrial production, you can see it here in the dark blue line, uh, it has turned that corner. When I spoke to you three months ago now, if you remember, uh, we were talking about a tentative phase A transition. Uh, U.S. industrial production had just begun to turn that corner. It had barely started to turn up, but the leading indicator evidence was saying that it would turn up. Uh, and now I'm glad to be here before you one quarter later uh, with a significant, statistically uh, important period of 12-12 rise uh, since the fourth quarter of 2016. Again, U.S. industrial production is still uh, down on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, it's receding at about 0.7% year-over-year. Uh, but the 312 rate of change, or the quarterly growth rate, is rapidly approaching uh, that phase B year-over-year -year growth, uh, accelerating growth trend. You'll see in orange, I also have a, another indicator here. This is the ITR leading indicator. Um, if any of you are ITR Trends Report subscribers, you can follow the activity of the ITR leading indicator on a month-to-month -month basis when you look at uh, your own basket of leading indicators and assess where your company is within the business cycle. The ITR leading indicator generally leads uh, U.S. industrial production by about six to nine months. So anything we see happen in the ITR leading indicator, we generally expect to see happen uh, within U.S. industrial production about six to nine months later. Uh, again, there's a, uh, a graphic that's not playing here, so a small technical glitch, and I apologize for that. But I want you to visually in your mind take that orange line and shift it to the right just about six to nine months and you can see that all of those cyclical troughs begin to line up very well. And the rise that we're seeing in that orange line in our proprietary leading indicator uh, is extending throughout the majority of 2017. Uh, this is a strong supporting indicator for our current macroeconomic outlook uh, because it supports that expectation of persistently stronger growth on a month-to-month -month and quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis for at least the next four to five quarters. Another widely uh, watched uh, economic indicator within, uh, within the news and the media that I'm sure many of you have heard of is the Purchasing Managers Index. Uh, the Purchasing Managers Index is a survey that is sent out to um, around, I believe, 300 uh, of the nation's uh, manufacturers throughout various portions of the economy, and it asks them a battery of questions concerning current market conditions. The reason that uh, I, as well as so many of my fellow colleagues, um, like the Purchasing Managers Index as a leading indicator is because it isn't based on expectations. It isn't based on what anyone thinks. It is based on what these different uh, purchasing executives are experiencing at the time of the survey. It looks at various different metrics like uh, production levels, new orders, inventories, and the current employment situation. You can see that the Purchasing Managers Index is currently up 16.1% uh, compared to the same month uh, last year. And this is actually the fastest pace of rise for the PMI um, since the recovery of the 2008 recession. So uh, this is a very significant leading indicator. Uh, and it serves uh, primarily in the industrial side of things. 
However, it uh, helps inform our expectations for the economy as a whole. So that same uh, nascent rise we're seeing in U.S. industrial production is once again corroborated by a very strong leading indicator. Just another piece of evidence we can put in our pocket when we ask ourselves, do I trust this outlook? Am I willing to act on this outlook? Here again, we have U.S. industrial production in the dark blue line uh, next to another leading indicator, the U.S. total industry capacity utilization rate. Um, a little bit of a mouthful, but all this is is essentially the, uh, the percentage of our total machinery and manufacturing capacity that is being used at a given time. It's currently just wavering around the zero line, so we're just about back up to where we were last year uh, on a cyclical basis. However, you can see as we look back through the past two recessions that the trajectory of this orange line mirrors almost exactly the trajectory of the U.S. industrial production annual growth rate coming out of that recession. Again, the situation is no different here, and we can see that that orange line is uh, beginning to rise fairly significantly, and our expectations for U.S. industrial production are mirroring it. Again, more evidence that our outlook is uh, sound at this point and that the current increase we're seeing in U.S. industrial production uh, isn't just a blip on the radar or uh, a quirk of economics, but in fact a sustainable business cycle trend. The U.S. total industri uh, industry capacity utilization rate uh, is especially important to look at because there are two different uh, stories going on with it. First off, it is a reactive indicator. Uh, when industrial production or just the industrial economy in general begins to turn up and demand begins to rise, obviously that puts more strain on equipment, right? We respond by turning on more machines, uh, by using more of what we have. But also at the same time, there's a causal factor here. As it responds to that demand and uh, utilization rates rise, uh, we start to put more strain and more wear and tear on our machines. They don't have as much downtime, so they also have less time for preventative maintenance and repair. And what this leads to is a higher turnover rate in our capital equipment, think our heavy industry, which also drives further industrial demand as people try and either expand their capacity in order to meet demand uh, and account for a loss of their equipment. Uh, so it has that kind of dual demand and supply push, which, which makes it historically, as you can see, a very accurate leading indicator uh, for, again, uh, the U.S. economy as a whole, but also U.S. industrial production. So clearly we've looked at the, uh, the non-industry parts, uh, the leading indicator evidence for whether or not this trend is sustainable. Uh, and based on uh, a handful of our most powerful leading indicators, um, all signs are saying that it is. That brings us to U.S. non-defense capital goods new orders. Again, this is a segment of the economy um, that's uh, easier to understand than it is to pronounce. Uh, non-defense capital goods new orders is simply our metric uh, for business investment, for capital investment. Uh, imagine everything from uh, printers to computers to engines to turbines to uh, any large piece of uh, textile or mill equipment. Basically, capital goods are any goods that are used in the production of goods but not used up themselves. So it excludes things such as uh, raw iron and steel uh, or fuel. Capital Goods New Orders is, a, uh, again, a widely watched uh, segment of the economy, and it also has been a point of significant pain for a lot of producers over the past year and a half. When we saw oil prices and metal prices fall, we entered uh, nearly a deflationary environment where uh, prices were falling rapidly, uh, and so there were these downward pricing pressures on a lot of large, heavy equipment where producers were being forced via competitive pressures uh, to reduce their prices in order to uh, maintain their market share. And what this did is it really squeezed their profit margins and we saw corporate profits decline fairly significantly. 
in this environment, those purchasing managers that I was talking about earlier were very hesitant to invest uh, in any large machinery or expensive pieces of capital goods uh, because the return on investment was simply uh, slim, if not non-existent, and didn't seem to be getting any better. As you can see, instead of reaching a nice V-shaped trough and falling into recession and immediately recovering, uh, we hovered in that negative uh, 3, negative 4, negative 5% year-over-year decline, uh, really for the better part of two years. Again, last quarter, uh, if you were here for my economic webinar, you, uh, you heard that, again, we had seen a tentative rise, uh, that certain indicators were beginning to look up, uh, and the growth rates were beginning to recover. Three months later, I have more good news for you. Uh, capital goods has transitioned definitively and statistically significantly to phase A recovery. Now, it might be a little hard for some of you to see here uh, because of our forecast lines. However, if you look at the light gray line that has been oscillating around the dark blue line, that is our capital goods new orders quarterly rate of change. The reason we like to look at quarterly rates of change is because they are more reactive to immediate changes in the economy than the 12-12, or the annual growth rate. The annual growth rate is a more uh, long-term outlook, where the quarterly uh, growth rate is more uh, short-term. And you can actually see that it has transitioned above that zero line into phase B, accelerating growth, uh, and is expanding on a year-over-year -year basis. So when I mentioned that many of you may still think well, if there's so much positivity, if we're seeing so much cyclical rise in the indicators, why do I still feel like we're in a recession? Well, that was because of the slow nature of our recovery, but that is diminishing rapidly, and especially moving through the first half of 2017, uh, I imagine that the majority of those pressures for most industries will have almost completely diminished. Again, one of uh, the characteristic economic factors of 2016 was that rapid decline in commodity prices. We saw it in agricultural, agricultural commodity prices when it came to uh, corn, wheat, and soy. Uh, we saw it with what I have on my screen here, uh, zinc, steel, tin, lead, copper, aluminum. Uh, chances are you could throw almost any metal on this chart right here and see that very similar trend of the 2015-2016 recessionary period. Uh, and again, uh, if you have uh, opened the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or Bloomberg News even once in the last year, um, you know all about the precipitous decline in oil prices. However, as quickly as uh, commodity prices tended to fall in 2015 and 2016, they have reacted very well to supply cuts and that nascent rise both in uh, U.S. and global industrial demand. You can see here that on a quarterly basis, all six of these benchmark metals are accelerating. They're up on a year-over-year -year basis, and prices are rising to much more favorable levels. Uh, that is one of the key drivers behind growth in 2017, is those higher price points that producers are going to be able to demand for their goods as their input costs rise, which, if handled well, will help to really pad their margins uh, and make up for some of the, uh, the, the red ink on their books from the previous year. Next, we have U.S. private sector employment. Before I even talk about employment, I want to just have you look at a general trend that we've seen over the past 10 or 12 slides. Uh, again, as an economist, looking at trends are uh, my job, ultimately. But it does not take an economist to pull out the overall trend that we've seen over the past slides, and that is one of rise. Uh, we've seen almost every one, if not every one, of these indicators and segments of the economy moving up toward that top right-hand quadrant where we want them to be. And again, that is really going to characterize 2017 into most of 2018 as well. Moving back to private sector employment, uh, you can see that we have exceeded the 2008 uh, private sector employment level. Um, that is a very big benchmark because it took us a significant period of time to recover from that recession. Uh, but despite that, the labor market has tightened. You can see that private sector employment growth is up 1.8% year over year. 
But I would like to draw your attention to the second bullet point here, job openings. Job openings are up over 5.5% compared to that roughly 2% in employment growth. And what that tells me is that we are opening more jobs and more jobs are being created than we have workers to fill them right now. That's leading to a very tight labor market and a lot of economists speculate that we're moving toward uh, full employment. Um, and I'm putting, I'm putting full employment in air quotes on my side uh, because it is one of those um, very technical and theoretical metrics that isn't well defined. But basically it means that it's the healthiest level of employment for the U.S. economy and that we generally won't move much past that on an un unemployment basis. But there are downsides uh, to a tight labor market. As I said before, um, from the producer standpoint, the employer standpoint, uh, it becomes very difficult to fill spots. Anecdotally, I've heard it throughout mostly the industrial sector, but the services sector as well. Uh, Chris, we're, we're hiring, we're expanding, we're building new buildings, we're bringing new machinery online, but we can't find the labor to work it. And it seems almost paradoxical that during a time of economic growth, we have trouble bringing employees in to facilitate that growth for us. And what that is, is a short-term disjoint between supply and demand, ultimately. Wages haven't caught up with the demand of workers on the employee side. And because of that, we'll see a lot of upward pressure on wages in the near term. Additionally, uh, we've seen the quit rate rising. Uh, again, almost paradoxically, during times of high employment, we see more people quit. Uh, on the surface, it doesn't make much sense, uh, but if you look a little deeper into it, what that means is that uh, U.S. workers are becoming comfortable with the labor market. They are becoming more sure that if they leave the job that perhaps they're only content with, not thrilled with, they'll be able to find another job. Or perhaps they've wanted to move into the suburbs and get out of the city, uh, and now they feel that the labor market is strong enough that they'll be able to get another job when they relocate. That dual factor of a rising quit, quit rate excuse me, uh, and higher wages can be very dangerous to an employer. It's great for an employee because it means job security and more money in your par uh, pocket. But it also means uh, more expenses on your side. It means uh, longer intervals in the job hunt. And uh, ultimately, it means uh, trouble retaining key employees if you don't offer those competitive pa uh, compensation packages. Again, on the, uh, on the risk side of things, we're also seeing the baby boomers uh, retiring en masse. They're getting older, they're moving out of the labor force. And as they move out of the labor force, you risk losing uh, long-term employees who represent a significant basis of skill and knowledge for your industry. Again, it's vital that you deal with these factors. Uh, you have to be able to offer competitive compensation if you want to both retain your senior uh, key employees while also attracting new young talent if you also want to realize the economic growth uh, in the business cycle expansion that we're seeing over the next two years. One of the ways we can do that is through uh, non-financial compensation, as I like to consider it. Again, it's going to be a balancing act of paying more and saving money that can be very difficult to realize uh, when it comes down to, to real market conditions. But one of the things that we're seeing with the younger generation, the, uh, the, the much conversed about millennial generation, is that they are less driven purely by pay, purely by that wage or that salary. Instead, they value fairly highly, by all accounts, uh, various different things such as increased vacation time, uh, maybe laxer dress standards uh, or flex hours. Come in 30 minutes late, work 30 minutes late. These, depending on your situation and depending on the nature of your industry, are all essentially quality of life improvements that are generally non-detrimental but often non-traditional. If these are things that you can easily employ in your company, it will help you not only retain, uh, retain talent, um, but also do so hopefully at a lower price point. For your more senior key employees that you're trying to keep on, 
uh, more so than their physical labor, they're valuable for their knowledge, for their accumulated experience. Uh, if your key employees, your senior employees, uh, transition either to uh, retirement or to a different job, before they pass on the majority of that accumulated experience, you're essentially losing out on, uh, on years worth of education. Because of that, especially when it comes to some of your employees who are looking at retiring, think about uh, offering, again, flexible schedules. Maybe they only work two hours a week or three hours a week. Maybe their most stressful clients or jobs are taken away from them, and they instead focus on training and transitioning uh, the new to mid-level employees. Again, all things you can do to try and balance and realize economic growth without losing out on all of your efficiency gains to higher wages. Ultimately, uh, that whole trend of economic growth being coupled with higher wages is being mirrored in the economy as a whole. Here we have two different price indexes, the consumer price index and the producer price index, um, which are simply metrics for inflation with the economy, uh, with the economy um, again, on one for the consumer side, um, for those who go grocery shopping and, and receive a wage, and one for the producer side, those who employ and those who uh, run the machines and run the mills and run the factories. You can see that they're both rising in tandem, uh, slightly different magnitudes of rise. The pace of inflation is going to vary between them for a little bit. But the important takeaway here is that price levels are rising. Inflation is rising. That means that it is a good time to be borrowing. Uh, if you can lock in rates, inflation is going to cut down on the real interest that you're paying. Um, so that will help you do some near-term financing. Uh, but it also means that if you, uh, if you aren't able to lock in low rates, if you aren't able to get under the gun on those commodity price increases that we see, you will be facing some significant pressures on your bottom line as your costs increase. Uh, and it's vital that you pay attention to that uh, so that you are, uh, your prices that you charge can at least mirror the costs that you incur and keep your uh, profit margins uh, static, if not expanding. As I mentioned before, with the cost of borrowing, uh, the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, this is the committee on the Fed that is in charge of uh, setting and regulating uh, the short-term interest rates, uh, really a benchmark for interest rates throughout the economy. Um, they've realized this. They're seeing the inflationary pressures take hold. They're seeing the strong labor market. And what I have here is their projections for what they expect to set interest rates as over the next three years and in the long run as well. You can see behind a little bit in those blue dots, uh, those are the expectations as of December 2016, the last time we talked. In the red, you can see their most recent expectations. And if you notice, uh, there's been almost no change that can be attributed to anything other than random noise. Again, what we're seeing in the economy, what the Federal Open Market Committee and the Fed, uh, what economists in general are seeing in the economy three months or six months ago, they're continuing to see that trend. Uh, that economic train is, is staying on track. It is moving at an understandable pace. Uh, and there haven't been any significant surprises that would cause us uh, to either alter our projections um, or alter our general long-term outlook for both the next three years and the long run as well. What I'll draw your eye to here is this longer run interest rate level, hovering around anywhere from 2.8 to 3.5%, really right on that 3% line. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty well uh, appreciated fact, is that we seem to be moving out of the level of low, in, uh, the period of low inflation and low interest rates. Um, the period of easy money is ending. Uh, the European Central Bank uh, has begun to whisper about mirroring uh, what the Federal Reserve has done with uh, raising the cost of borrowing. They haven't yet, uh, but they have talked about ending uh, their quantitative easing or essentially free money program. And again, what that means is that not only within the U.S., but around the world, as we progress through the next two, three, four, five years, it is going to be more expensive to operate your business replacing your equipment, 
expanding your factory floor, all of that is going to be more expensive in the long run as interest rates uh, really double down on the cost that you're paying. And it's important to plan for that. If you were planning on expanding uh, in 2017 or 2018, maybe 2019, you haven't decided, sooner is better. Again, if you were to expand right now, you have the entirety of 2017 and 2018 of general economic expansion, as well as relatively affordable costs of borrowing in order to buoy you and help get you on your feet during that transitionary period. If you risk waiting too long into the second half of 2018, you risk uh, incurring significant capital expenditures, spending significant amounts of cash, uh, and taking some significant risks as we are expecting to move into an economic recession. Depending on the industry that you're directly tied to or loosely tied to, that can change by a few months. Um, but it is important to know that the first half of 2019 is going to be a relatively difficult time compared to what we've seen in the last year or expect to see over the next two years. So here I've prepared for you a slide that, again, I urge you to come back to. Uh, print this out and keep it in your office. Um, circulate it to your managers and your team leaders. This is eight steps that we've compiled here at ITR Economics, eight management objectives in order for you to take advantage of growth over the next two years. Again, as business cycle consultants, we understand that there are ups and downs, not only in the economy, but in companies as well. Uh, they're natural and as close, as a, close to a law in economics as you can come. Because of that, our goal here is to help PMMI and to help your members realize as much growth during the upturns of the economy and during the upside of your business cycle while mitigating decline during the downside of your economy. And this is what I have prepared these management objectives for. They're for the expansion in 2017 and 2018. First and foremost, uh, we've already done this on a macroeconomic scale. Know where you and your markets are in the business cycle. Knowing whether your markets are seeing increased demand uh, beyond just that anecdotal experience uh, is vital for you to make informed, long-term strategic decisions. This is why, if you jump down to number eight, follow the, what I consider the must-watch leading indicators. We've looked at them already. PMI, ITRLI, housing, um, employment. These are all things that you can keep track of during our quarterly economic webinars, uh, and you can also see in our monthly ITR trends report if you're looking for a more granular approach. Budget for continued overall expansion in 2017. Uh, barring immediate uh, restructuring or uh, stagnation with your, within your company, your industries are going to be expanding in 2017 and 2018. And that means that the economy is going to facilitate risk. It is better to take a risk and fail uh, in fall while the ground is rising up to meet you than when it is falling beneath your feet. The next two years are the times to take the more um, the more immediate and the more risky managerial decision in order to grow your business. Ultimately, as I said before, retention is paramount. Keep your most important employees and do everything you can to try and hasten the process of filling uh, empty slots within your payroll. Ultimately, when it comes down to both economic and company growth, you're only as good as your employees. And if you don't have the employees either hired or trained in a uh, timely manner, you're just not going to realize the growth that you want to or expected to. Again, come back to these management objectives uh, and use these to plan for the next uh, seven to eight quarters before that mild 2019 recession that we're expecting. And now, speaking of your core markets, I'd like to transition away from the broad strokes macroeconomic view uh, to the, the more uh, granular industry view. Here we have our forecasts for pharmaceutical and medical device production. You can see on the left we have our 12-month moving average of the production index, uh, and you can see that it's rising at a significant pace and will continue to do so over the next two years. In late 2019, uh, 2018 into early 2019, we do expect a slight slowdown, and you can see that as the rates of change approach the zero line. 
However, the U.S. population is both growing and aging, and more people, and older people especially, incur more medical costs and demand more medical goods. Uh, because of that, if you're involved in the medical industry, and especially the medical device or pharmaceuticals industry, you have supply and demand on your side. Uh, demand is rising, and you will be able to facilitate that expansion in supply in order to meet it. Here we have food and foods preparation production. Again, uh, we're seeing significant rise on an annual basis. However, we are approaching a business cycle peak. Luckily, as I mentioned before, uh, through 2018 and over the past year, the U.S. consumer uh, has been the dominant driving factor within the economy. That's not going to change again because of this. You see that nice 12-12 soft landing, a period of slower growth and stagnation more than decline, uh, followed by another period of uh, expansion as we move through that recessionary period. Uh, really, every aspect of the, of the food and foods preparation industry is expanding on a year-over-year -year basis. That is the general trend. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, we're seeing general commodity price rise, but food prices have lagged behind a little bit. Um, if you're directly tied to food prices and they factor into your cost structure, um, ensure that you're not jumping the gun and rising your prices too quickly because you don't want to get caught out and outcompeted by any of your competitors and undercut, as I should say. Uh, if I have to have a mantra for the next two years, it is prioritize market share over profits. So if you have to let your, your prices decline, you have to take a slight hit to profitability in order to maintain or attract new customers, do that. Because ultimately, market share is what will help you weather long-term decline during recessions like 2019 and beyond. Again, personal care products, uh, products production, excuse me. Uh, we're in a period of slower growth right now. You can see on an annual basis we're uh, stagnating, ticking down a little bit, but we do expect a general rise over the next two years to take hold uh, over the next one to two quarters. Um, again, without sounding like a broken record, uh, this is being driven by those strong consumer trends that we're talking about. Uh, people are not only going out and buying more things, they're buying more expensive things. So over the next two years, if you're uh, looking into deploying um, higher price point goods or perhaps uh, more luxury goods, if you want to think about it that way, we are in the market for that right now. Um, there's a metric called disposable personal income. Uh, and what that is, is essentially your after-tax, after-expenses wages. It's money that's burning a hole in your pocket. We've been seeing that rise for almost a year now, uh, which is signaling that the U.S. consumer is not only willing to buy more expensive things, uh, but they also have the wherewithal to do so as well. Beverages, coffee, and tea production. Uh, again, a strong consumer tied industry. Uh, we expect general growth through 2019. Uh, but you see that in the 2018-2019 period, that annual growth rate really kind of slows down to the zero line. Um, that's going to be a period that is a time for caution, uh, where you have to make sure to maintain competitive and retain your customers, uh, because it's going to be about a year or a year and a half where there is very little new business coming to the market. So you have to keep what you have if you want to maintain your market share. Uh, but again, a strong consumer-linked trend. Uh, the consumer is buying and will recover, uh, and we don't expect you to fall into a full-blown technical recession during the next three years. Chemicals and cleaning products production. Uh, imagine your, uh, your bleaches, your ammonias, uh, your detergents of all kinds, uh, your soaps. Um, we almost fell into recession over the past six months or so, uh, but those, those rising chemical prices, again, being driven by higher energy and oil prices generally, uh, have helped this uh, segment of the economy to just barely skate by that zero line. We're expecting uh, at least two years of uh, significant growth, 1.9% uh, growth in 2017, followed by uh, an equally respectable 1.5% growth, uh, growth, excuse me, in 2018, 
Uh, but as a caution, by early 2019, this segment of the economy will fall into recession. So it's paramount where you might be able to get away with more risky behavior um, in those other uh, food and beverage and uh, personal beauty care product lines uh, if you're exposed to those. Uh, on the more chemical industrial side of things, you will be facing some significant headwinds moving into 2019 uh, so that it's paramount you do everything you can over the next two years in order to prepare for that. Durable hard goods components and parts production. Uh, again, another one of these economic uh, indicators that is relatively vague in name, but this is essentially any good that is sold that is uh, not immediately consumed and expected to last uh, three years or longer. Imagine everything from hardware to automotive parts to computers, <laughs> surprisingly enough, I know some of you may doubt that, uh, to furniture. Uh, there are two different trends going on in here, uh, those catering to the industrial side of things and those catering to the consumer side of things. Again, your furnitures, uh, your home hardwares, imagine everything you'd buy at a Lowe's. Uh, that's all doing uh, very well right now and is outperforming uh, the general industry as a whole. We expect to see uh, some significant growth breaking into that 3% range even in 2017 if you're uh, closely linked to the consumer, uh, whereas uh, our industrial compatriots uh, are, are feeling a little bit of pain right now. They're basically even with the next year and they won't see quite as much positivity. Uh, again, we do expect you to fall into a very mild recession by 2019, uh, but again, it's not going to be a capital R recession like we're used to, uh, but more of a period of stagnation or decline. Now, very briefly, I'd like to talk a little bit about the global economy. Again, we know what's happening uh, in some of these key uh, industries. We know what's happening in the U.S. as a whole. Um, but what can we be expect if we are tied to uh, our foreign allies, our foreign friends? Well, here I have some global leading indicators. Like we looked at the PMI for the U.S., here we have the Eurozone composite in blue. Uh, that's for manufacturing and services. We have the EU manufacturing PMI and the JP Morgan global PMI. Again, you can see that they're all moving in unison right now. Uh, they're all above zero and they are rising. We are gaining traction. If you look at the national leading indicators for the OECD, uh, you can consider that the uh, essentially club of uh, well-off or wealthy countries. Uh, it's up. The major Asian countries, the leading indicators are up. Brazil, Canada, China, India, Japan, all of the leading indicators are looking up. While there's some significant, uh, significant differences between some of these countries, imagine uh, China and Brazil, uh, in two very different situations right now, um, improvement is the name of the game right here. So if you're linked to the export or import side of things, uh, 2017 and 2018 are only going to be better uh, than the last year or two. I've included some uh, charts for you here showing just a brief overview of industrial production within uh, different major economic areas. Here you can see uh, North America. I have South America, uh, Europe, and Asia. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but again, I urge you to come back to this and if there are any uh, countries you're interested in, in increasing your exposure to uh, or perhaps are uh, worried about, uh, please uh, look in and it's a good brief dive uh, on, the, on the global economic picture in general. And finally, I had your management objectives for the 2017-2018 period. How do you maximize that growth? Uh, and here I have some management objectives for mitigating that decline in 2019, that second part of the picture. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, you'll notice that these are the same objectives I had for you last quarter. Uh, again, our long-term outlook has not changed. Um, if you took any of these management objectives to heart during the last quarter, consider doing so. Um, stick with those plans because it's only going to get more and more vital as we move toward 2019. Again, the most important uh, management objective I can give you in order to mitigate not only the 2019 recession, uh, but again, any recessionary periods to come, use periods of expansion to capture market share, undercut your competitors, release new products, 
uh, invest in marketing, brand yourself. Capturing that market share is what is going to protect the core of your business during times of turmoil. That's all I have for you today. Um, I'm going to turn it back uh, to Rebecca. And again, if you have any questions about any of the metrics we've looked at uh, moving forward or any questions about the economy in general that perhaps I glazed over, um, please either get in touch with Rebecca and she'll forward them over to me and my team. Uh, or you can contact questions at itreconomics.com, uh, and we would love to get back to you. Chris, thank you for the great reflection of the current economy and issues at hand for the packaging and processing industry. I'd like to open up the session for questions. Please enter any questions you would like to have answered in the message uh, chat box on your screen, or you can press star to unmute your phone. Um, and so we'll open it up for questions. Okay, Chris, I have no questions from the audience at this time. Um, just make sure. And um, we did have one, uh, sorry, we did have one question early in the webinar because um, of some technical difficulties that we were having. Um, the uh, presentation was muted for a, a few minutes. I think at the beginning you were making some opening remarks. Um, just probably around um, slide one. Um, and uh, oh, we do have a question. Hold on. Um, could you provide any specifics on the Mexican economy and potential challenges? Absolutely. I was curious if that's going to come up. Uh, everything Mexico is obviously a hot button issue right now. Um, so I'm going to start again. As I did earlier, I moved right past all of the political speculation, the policy speculation, um, and I looked at what the data is saying. When it comes to Mexico, Mexico has really developed itself as, a, as really one of, the, one of the front runners of developing nations over the past 10 to 20 years since uh, NAFTA came about. They've liberalized their economy. Um, they've become relatively competitive, low-cost manufacturers. Uh, and that trend shows no immediate signs of abating. Um, we've seen a lot of movement and in capital investment into Mexico from both Canada and the U.S., and they're also st uh, starting to serve as a hub for foreign goods as well. The long-term prospects, uh, if you've listened to us at ITR for Mexico, are bright. Um, they have demographics on their side, much that we here at the U.S. do. Uh, and again, uh, they've, they've made some significant strides in, in liberalizing and um, privatizing their economy. And now I will give the caveat that I give every time. We here at ITR Economics are an economic and business cycle forecasting firm. Uh, we are not a political forecasting for, uh, firm. Obviously the links between the economy and politics are inextricable and oftentimes obvious. So I will consider them and I will discuss them. Um, but we do not make uh, judgments about whether or not one political action is likely uh, or one election is likely to sway either way uh, because essentially, and we all saw that this year, statistically there is just no robust way uh, to predict that on the long term. Problems facing Mexico, NAFTA. NAFTA has been the single largest driver of economic growth and prosperity for the Mexican people most likely ever. Again, it helped to liberalize uh, their economy as barriers were broken down and they were forced to compete with the U.S., the global powerhouse. Uh, if we were to repeal NAFTA, uh, there would likely be some significant pain um, on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, more expensive imports and exports would limit their access to uh, cheap agricultural products from us, uh, but also uh, limit their exposure to foreign direct investment um, in a lot of those large manufacturers, uh, again, imagine your Fords, your Carriers, um, your Oshkosh, that have been moving over there. Uh, any barriers to free trade, imagine uh, taxes or legislation levied against the Mexican economy, 
will likely be the largest hindrance to their long-term economic prosperity that we see right now. Uh, but again, in the immediate term, uh, looking just at the economic data, on an industrial production basis, uh, they are even with the previous year. Uh, they're actually the, uh, the best performing uh, North American nation, beating out both uh, the U.S. and Canada. So uh, cautious optimism is, is the name of the game um, with Mexico. Uh, but in general, it's still a very receptive place to either relocating or re-headquartering uh, your manufacturing basis. Uh, one of the most important parts about the differences between Mexico and the U.S. is that here in the U.S. we have what we call capital-intensive manufacturing. Imagine the high-tech, uh, fancy lab coat-operated manufacturing sectors, uh, robotics, AI, uh, heavy industrial processes that are very technical. That's what we do well. But we also have very high wages, meaning that labor-intensive production Imagine uh, sewing or packaging things or riveting things by hand. We don't do that well because it's simply too expensive. Um, if you want to realize growth in Mexico, it's going to be a story of uh, finding a way to separate out your capital intensive aspect of your manufacturing in the US while moving your labor intensive manufacturing to Mexico. That's how you can, you can really play both sides of the coin there. Thank you, Chris. Um, one more question. Uh, aside from the political ramifications of the triggering of Brexit, which happened yesterday, can you provide um, any insight on what people should be looking out for in terms of um, activity in the Eurozone coming up in the near future? Absolutely. The Eurozone has been a fascinating economic entity over the past year. Uh, we've been looking at uh, really political strife and infighting within the region, uh, more so since we've really seen their founding, obviously, uh, Britain walking away from the table uh, or speaking about doing so. Um, from Marine Le Pen's side of the aisle in France, we've heard some rumblings of potentially following suit. Uh, we've heard a lot of outcries against the Euro and about globalization in general, which used to be the hallmarks of the European economy. Uh, despite that, Europe is doing well. Uh, Western Europe in particular uh, is, is growing at a, at a good clip in the high 1-2% to range. Um, they're still struggling with some unemployment regionally, uh, but overall they're benefiting from a relatively and historically weak euro, uh, so it's a good time for uh, European importers as opposed to people uh, trying to uh, sell into Europe. Uh, but ultimately, the biggest risk in Europe uh, is, again, I mentioned it earlier, that combination of low interest rates and quantitative easing, that very loose, easy, cheap monetary policy that we've seen from the European Central Bank. Um, essentially, what this does in the long run is uh, artificially cheapen investments. And one risk uh, that we see from that in the long term is that if they persist with these easy money policies, these artificially low interest rates, uh, that it could lead to bubble investing, i.e., if people had to pull the full market uh, pay, excuse me, the full market driven price of various investments or goods or commodities, they wouldn't because the return on investment isn't there. So it'll be uh, crucial over the next year or two, in the longer term, um, to look at the actions of the European Central Bank. Um, right now, many uh, spectators are betting on uh, the ECB lagging behind whatever the Federal Reserve does by between um, four to six quarters, which is a pretty good bet historically. They tend to follow our lead. Um, and if interest rates do begin to rise very quickly, um, that's when you know you have to start uh, potentially pulling back uh, and, again, protecting yourself uh, from any kinds of external shocks uh, because it could result in a, in a mild market correction and general economic downturn. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's all the questions we have for today. Uh, once again, I would like to apologize to all of our participants for the technical issues at the front of the webinar. Sorry about that. Um, but I would like to remind you that this webinar will be available for download and watching at a later date, probably within a few days. It will be on the PMMI.org website. On behalf of PMMI, thank you for participating today.
As a final note, you'll receive an email to complete an evaluation on today's webinar. Um, please complete the evaluation as soon as possible and let us know how we can improve this webinar. Um, and thank you very much. Chris, you've been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure as always.